uh, I'd like to read two passages with you. So first, I'd like you, if you have a Bible with you, otherwise I think you can read it on the screen, but we'll turn to Matthew chapter 22. Matthew chapter 22. So it's the parable of the great banquet. If you know that the children's song, I cannot come, I cannot come to the banquet, don't trouble me now, that one, that's the parable that we're going to be looking at this morning from Luke, and in Matthew is a, is a parallel. So it's, it's almost identical in many ways, but it's different in a few ways that I think are going to help us to understand what our Lord Jesus is teaching us in that parable. So we'll go to Matthew chapter 22 first, verses 1 through 14. Matthew 22, 1 through 14. This is the word of God. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. Again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, See, I've prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully, and killed them. The king was angry, and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So this parable is about a a wedding feast. And so I'd also like to read with you from Revelation chapter uh, chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. So we go from a parable of the Lord Jesus about a wedding feast to a vision of one of the apostles, the apostle John, also about a wedding feast. But this wedding feast is the wedding feast that's going to happen when the Lord Jesus returns to this earth. And he's having a vision of that in this passage, Revelation chapter 19. We'll read the verses 6 through 10. So this is the Apostle John. He's speaking about what he's seeing and hearing in his vision. And he says, Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, and like the sound of mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. Then I fell down at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, you must not do that. I'm a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Okay, now we'll turn to our text. We'll go to Luke chapter 14. This is the passage that's going to have our attention this morning. Luke chapter 14, the verses 12 through 24. 
Luke 14, 12 through 24. So just so we kind of know a little bit of what's going on uh, before we come into this passage, in Luke 14, verse 1, we read that one Sabbath when he went to dine at the house of a ruler of the Pharisees, they were watching him carefully. So the Lord Jesus was invited to the house of, of a Pharisee, a prominent Pharisee, one of the rulers of the Pharisees. But when they invited him, they didn't invite him in goodwill. They invited him because they, they want to check him out. They want to see what he's all about. And so that's sort of the context. That's, that's where Jesus is when, he's, uh, when we come to our text here in verse 12. So we go to verse 12 now. I'm going to read our text. It says, he, that's the Lord Jesus then. He also said to the man who had invited him, When you give a dinner or a banquet, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbors, lest they also invite you in return and you be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, and you'll be blessed because they cannot repay you. For you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just." When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, Blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. But he, that's Jesus, said to him, A man once gave a great banquet and invited many. And at the time for the banquet, he sent out his servant to say to those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a field, and I must go out and see it. Please have me excused. And others said, I've bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to examine them. Please have me excused. Another said, I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. So the servant came and reported these things to his master. Then the master of the house became angry and said to his servant, Go out quickly to the streets and lanes of the city and bring in the poor and the crippled and the blind and the lame. And the servant said, Sir, what you commanded has been done, and still there is room. And the master said to the servant, go out to the highways and the hedges and compel people to come in, that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. That's our text. Brothers and sisters, congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, guests and visitors, it's perhaps hard to imagine this morning, on a cold January morning, but I'm going to ask you to, to try and remember if you can. It, it helps a little bit, the room that we're in sort of looks like, a, well it is really, a banquet hall, right? You can imagine someone celebrating a wedding in this room, but January is not the most popular month for weddings, and so I'm going to ask you to imagine summertime, it's warm, it's pleasant, you get an invitation to a wedding in, your, in, in the mail or your church mailbox or someone hands it to you, that you're invited to come to this wedding banquet, to come and celebrate a wedding, a marriage for this couple, and so you get that, and there's a little RSVP card, or maybe you've got to send an email or go online or something. Maybe there's an app for that, I don't know. But anyways, you can respond, and you think, you look at your schedule, and you think, yeah, that date, I can go, I'm available, no problem. And so you respond, and you say, I'll come. But I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but I certainly have. Um, before going to Papua New Guinea, I was a pastor in Langley, Langley Canadian Reformed Church for seven years, and there was lots of weddings there, lots of invitations to weddings, and so I sent lots of responses back saying, yes, I'll be there. But you know what? They always put these banquets on a Friday afternoon or Saturday afternoon, and as that time comes closer, as it starts to get a little closer, you, you start to think of, you know, if I didn't have to go to that banquet, it really is a nice afternoon, you know, I could, I could cut the grass, could get some work done around the house, work in the garden, 
clean up a little bit, or I could go golfing, or I could go fishing, or go for a walk, spend some time with the family, and all of a sudden, as that day gets closer, you, you start to think of all the other priorities that you have in your life that are kind of fighting against the priority of going to this banquet. Now, to my knowledge, I never gave in to that temptation to not show up at the wedding banquet, but I wouldn't doubt it if some people have. And you know as well as I do, you go to a wedding banquet and there's a few empty chairs around, right? And you kind of wonder, where are those people? There's a spot for them, but they didn't come. And now, if you did give in to that temptation and you didn't go, I don't think that the offense would be that great. It wouldn't be such a big deal, right, if you didn't go to that wedding banquet to celebrate with the couple. The couple might be a little, uh, you know, they might wonder. They probably won't even notice because there's so many people. Maybe, you know, whoever it is that actually is paying for that meal that you're not enjoying, they might be a little upset that you're not there. But quite quickly, all would be forgotten or forgiven, and you would move on. But the wedding feast that the Lord Jesus is talking about in our parable, it's different, isn't it? To, to not show up at, at this banquet is, actually causes great offense. It causes great offense to the master. The master becomes angry at those who, who can't come. And so what the Lord Jesus is telling us in this parable is that there is this wedding feast and that it's absolutely crucial that you attend this feast. It's the most important wedding feast that you could possibly attend. And he's inviting you. He's inviting the people whom he's telling this, this parable to, and he's inviting us as well to come to this banquet. Don't give your excuses. Don't make other things your priorities. Come, set this banquet and this time as your priority. Because this banquet is none other, none other than the banquet that God the Father in heaven is throwing for His Son, Jesus Christ. As He joins together on the last day, when, when He'll return from heaven, He's going to host this banquet. And all those who have not only received this invitation, but have come to the banquet will share the joy of, of this wedding forever and ever and ever. So our theme this morning is that the Lord Jesus invites us to feast at the banquet of the Father. And we're going to see three things in this parable. First of all, we have to see that there's a very strong warning in here for us. Secondly, we also need to understand what's the purpose of the Lord Jesus when he says this parable. What's he after? What's he telling us? And thirdly, we'll see that there's, there's a call to action for us as well. As we're called to imitate the very grace that we have been shown. So first of all, the warning. We need to hear the warning and, and so Jesus is, is telling this story. He's at this banquet. He's been invited. And first he, he tells the, the host, you know, when you're invited to, or when you invite people to a banquet, don't just invite your friends, your neighbors, your family. You need to invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind, and then you'll be blessed. And then he goes into this parable. So this parable is connected with this invitation. And it's a well-known parable, isn't it? If, if you've been in church, if you've grown up in church, you, you probably are familiar with this parable. Maybe if you, even if you haven't grown up in church, maybe you're, you're going, I, I've, I've heard about that story before. It's a parable of the Lord Jesus about this, this wedding feast. And it starts with this, this invitation. So we have this this. We understand that there's a man, a great man, and he's hosting a great banquet. And it seems like the invitations have already gone out, 
And people have already responded saying they're going to come. So there's this expectation that these people are going to come. But then when, when all the food and everything for the banquet is ready, then the master says to his servant, okay, now I want you to go out and all those people who said they were going to come, just let them know now. The banquet's ready. It's time to come. So the, the servant goes out and he does that. But then you get all these excuses back, right? The first man... There in verse 18, he says, I bought a field. I need to go out and, and examine that, so please excuse me. And the second one says, well, I've bought five yoke of oxen. So please have me excuse. I need to check them out. The third man, he doesn't even give an excuse. He doesn't say, please excuse me. He just says, well, I've, I'm just married. I can't come. If you look at these for a moment, we'll try to see what, what sort of holds them together, all these, these three responses. Well, obviously, they're all excuses. They're, they're all giving reasons why they can't come. But these reasons why they can't come, if you, if you think about it for a little bit, you realize that they're all pretty normal, not even really bad things, right? The first man, he, he's busy with real estate, He's bought land. It, it's a very normal, it's a very sort of this worldly, this earthly thing. What, what could be more earthly than buying a piece of land? I've bought this land. I've made this transaction. And so I, I need to make sure that this goes through. If you've bought a house, you know that that's a, that's a big deal. That's probably the largest investment of money that you're going to make in your lifetime. You want to make sure that Everything checks out with that. So he says, please excuse me, I can't come. The second man, he's sort of involved more with business, right? It's an agricultural society, and so he's bought five yoke of oxen. It's like you've bought five new pickup trucks for your, new, for your, for your small business. That's a, that's a big transaction. And so he's going to go and make sure that everything's all right with the oxen, that the money gets exchanged, everything's good. Again, a very normal thing to be involved with business very normal thing to make sure that, that that big purchase goes through okay. And the third thing is, again, very normal, very earthly thing. It's marriage. And with the third one, like I said, you kind of notice that there's almost this decline, though, in these excuses because the third guy, he doesn't even say, please excuse me. He just says, I've, I've just married a wife. And so, Maybe it's the obligations of marriage. Perhaps more likely it's the pleasures of marriage that are making this man say, I've got more important things in my life right now. I can't come to the banquet. So all of these people are, you could say, they're, they're distracted by, by this worldly pursuits. They're distracted by, by normal everyday things that I would guess a lot of us, the kinds of things that a lot of us get distracted by, a lot of the things that, that, that are priorities for a lot of us. Now, we need to ask the question, who is Jesus talking to when he tells this parable? Who is he addressing? Well, he's addressing, remember, he's at the house of, of a Pharisee. He's dining with a bunch of Pharisees. And so it, it seems that he's addressing the Pharisees when he, when he tells this parable. And he's saying to them, listen, guys, you guys are like these three excuse makers. You guys are the, are the excuse makers in this parable. Why? Because you've become distracted by this worldly pursuits. The things of this life, your, your, your land and your business and, and your family life and things like that have become too much of a priority for you. You've set those things as your priorities and, and other things that are more important are no longer priorities for you. Well, what is it that's, that's more important in the parable? It's this banquet, right? He's saying... 
That's, these, this, this worldly pursuits are more important to you than this banquet. Well, what is the banquet that Jesus is talking about? He's telling a story, right? And, and things in the story, they sort of point to, to things. As people hear the story, they're supposed to say, oh, I'm, I'm that person, and this stands in for that. So what is the banquet? Well, I'm convinced that the banquet that Jesus is talking about is the banquet that we read about in Revelation chapter 19. It's the, it's the banquet that's going to happen on the last day when Jesus returns. There's going to be this wedding feast. And I believe that, now this, our, our text doesn't talk about a wedding feast, but the parallel passage in Matthew 22 does talk about a, a wedding feast, right? It talks about a father throwing a wedding feast for his son. And then you've got Revelation 19 that speaks about a wedding feast that's, that's going to happen on the last day. But you also have the Lord Jesus in verse 14 speaking about that day. So we know that that time frame is in his mind. He says, and you'll be blessed when you give a feast, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind, verse 14, and you'll be blessed because they cannot repay you for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So your, your mind should be set not on on things now, but instead, you should be thinking about that day, the resurrection of the just. And the resurrection is going to happen when? When the Lord Jesus returns. So when the Lord Jesus returns, there's going to be uh, this resurrection. The dead will be raised. And those who are in Christ, those who have been washed with the blood of Christ, are going to be joined together with Christ like like a, a... A bride is joined together with a groom. A wife is joined together to a husband. And they're going to live together forever. And Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, you're not focused on that day. You're focused on other things instead. You're focused on things of this life. You're focused on temporal things. You're supposed to be focused on, on the resurrection. If, if you know anything about, um, well, I'll, I'll tell you. Uh, in, in the, among the Jews of Jesus' day, there were some that actually rejected the resurrection. They didn't believe in the resurrection. Those are the Sadducees. But the Pharisees were the group that were real proud. No, no, we believe in the resurrection. They're always fighting against the Sadducees. There is no resurrection. Yes, there is a resurrection. And so Jesus is talking to the people who are real proud about their belief in the resurrection. And he's saying, you guys aren't even thinking about the resurrection. You're focused on on this life and what's happening here and now. You're supposed to be focused on that. Now, what is it that would have caused the Pharisees to to become focused on things of of this life, of this earth, and, and lose focus on the resurrection? I think sort of, piecing a lot of things together, I think we can break it down to two, two temptations for the Pharisees that I think are really relevant for us today. The first temptation for them was the temptation of presumption. Presumption. What, I'm, what I mean is that th- they had this temptation to presume that, that this was all there is, that they had sort of reached the peak Right? They believed that they were the covenant people of God. And they believed that among the covenant people of God, they were the leaders. They were sort of the best. They were the rule keepers, right? They were the people who determined this is right, this is wrong. This is how you follow and serve God and please him. And this is how you don't. And it was sort of their job to teach that to everyone else. So they believed that they had arrived. We're the covenant people of God. We get the covenant blessings of God. God looks favorably upon us. He loves us. So we're it. And they they had received a lot of wealth. They'd become like the prominent class, the rich people among the Jews of that day. And so they thought, well, there's the blessings of God right there. What more is there to look forward to? This presumption. And their presumption led them to another temptation which was the temptation of consumption. The temptation to consume. 
and it makes sense, right? If you believe that the here and now is all there is, if you believe that you've arrived, you're living under the blessing of God, God is just giving all these things to you, so what, what's the goal of your life then? Well, just to receive all these things, to consume, consume, consume. Nice feasts, big houses, live for the day, take in as much power, as much pleasure as you can, because here is where it's at. We've arrived. We're living the good life now. Now, I hope that as you, as you hear sort of this description of the Pharisees, you realize that this description can so easily describe us today as well. As we sit here as members of the church, you've, maybe you've grown up in the church, maybe you've come lately to the church, but, but you, you've heard about all the, you know, the blessings that come from God, and, and you've learned about the covenant where, where God says, I'm your God and you're my people. And it's easy to sort of rest on that and say, well, we're the people of God. So we've arrived. There's nothing more to look forward to. We're it. This is it. We've reached the pinnacle. And, and, and as Reformed people, we can quite easily do this. We look back at our history and you say, wow, all this amazing history of Reformed doctrine. And, and we know the word of God. And, and it's sort of our job to teach that to everyone else. So we're like the Pharisees, right? We're at the top of the heap. We're it. We've arrived. But it's presumption. God doesn't teach us to live by presumption. God teaches us to live by faith. By humble and repentant faith. Not boasting in ourselves, like the Pharisees were prone to do, but looking every single day in independence on God. But we're so tempted to live by presumption. And we're also so tempted to live by consumption. Especially here in Canada. We're so rich. We have so many material blessings. And it's so easy for the pursuit of of a house, land, for uh, our business, and for the pleasures of life, the pleasures of marriage, or, or so many other pleasures. Our, our culture specializes in providing pleasures on TV, on your iPad, um, anywhere you go, to the theater, to the restaurant, in your car. We're just full of, of pleasures, so many pleasures to soak up. And so it's so easy to live for the moment to live for the day, to be distracted by, I've got to get this done, you know, I've got this work to do, I've got to grow my business, I've got to pay my mortgage, I've got to relax, I've got to enjoy myself. And all of a sudden, we are entirely focused, all of our priorities are on things of this earth. And what Jesus is telling us through this parable is that we need to repent of that. He's saying that, that is, that's wrong. We cannot let these things, these things, yes, that are good and normal and that we're going to be involved with, but we can't let them become priorities in our lives. We need to be, have something else be our priority. We need to have the day of Christ's return. We need to have the, the spiritual blessings that we look forward to. On that day, we need to have, because that's God's priority, right? God is working all things in history, not so that we can live a comfortable life, not so our business can grow well and, and we can prosper. God is working all things in history, even today, so that on the day that He's appointed, His Son Jesus Christ can return. And all of the people that He's chosen in eternity can be joined together with Christ and live forever and ever in this blessed union. That's God's priority. And Jesus is saying that needs to be our priority as well because if it's not, and here's the warning, if it's not, there's judgment. God doesn't look kindly on those who allow the things of this world to become a priority. 
In our text, what happens when those men give their excuses? What happens? The master becomes angry. And at the end of the passage, he says, he says, I tell you, in verse 24, he says, I tell you, none of those men who were invited shall taste my banquet. In the parallel passage, it's even stronger. He says, kill those murderers and burn the city. He's talking about judgment. That's another truth of God's word. Just like God's word teaches us to look forward to the return of Jesus Christ. And that on that day, all of God's people will be joined together with Christ. We're also taught that on that day, there will be judgment. There will be God's anger poured out on all of those who reject Christ. And who reject God's priorities. And who instead live for the here and now. And today. So Jesus is warning us. And, 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 and in that warning, there's that invitation, right? Don't set these things on your pride. It's so easy, but don't let it happen. Set God's priorities. The eternal things. The heavenly things. The return of Christ. Set that as your priority in this life. So we need to hear that warning. Secondly, we also need to know the purpose of the Lord Jesus Christ. And to, to sort of understand this, we just have to sort out a few more items from the parable. Okay, so the three people are the Pharisees. And we can definitely hear that warning of the Pharisees for ourselves today. The banquet is the great banquet that's going to happen when Jesus Christ returns. So who's the master? Who's the master? Well, I'm convinced that the master is God the Father. Think of that parallel passage in Matthew 22. It's a father throwing a wedding banquet for his son. But here's where things get a little tricky, because in Matthew 22, who's the son? Well, it's God the Son, Jesus Christ. But in this passage, who is Jesus? Well, Jesus is actually the servant. Jesus is the servant. So God the Father is the master, and he's sending Jesus to bring this message, right? So the, the, those excuse makers are the Pharisees. Well, who is it that's bringing this warning to the Pharisees right there? It's Jesus, right? Jesus is the servant that's, that's giving this warning. So what, what is the, the, the servant's purpose? That's what we're going to look at now. So the servant comes back and he says, you know, they, they've all said they can't come to the banquet. And the, the master becomes angry and he says, well, then, then fine. Then go out into the city and call in all the, the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind. If they don't want to come, then we'll find people who will come. And it's a certain class of people, isn't it, that's going to come. Who are the people now who are invited to this banquet? Well, it's actually the people who weren't at the banquet that Jesus was at with the Pharisee. Remember earlier in verse 13, he said, when you give a feast, invite, it's the same four, the poor, the crippled, the lame, the blind. Why did Jesus say that? Because they weren't at the banquet where he was. Because if you're rich and prosperous and presumptuous, you don't invite those kind of people to your banquet. But now, inside the parable, the master is saying, then you need to go and you need to invite these people in. These people who, who, who lack the things of this, this the lack the good things. The things that the Pharisees had, these people didn't have. They're, they're poor, they're crippled, they're lame, they're blind. The Pharisees were the upwardly mobile. They were the powerful people in the culture. These people have no power. They're the outcasts. You need to invite them in. Now, so who, who are these people? Who are these people sort of standing in for? Well, I'm just going to sort of cut to the chase here and say that what Jesus, who Jesus is referring to here are basically the people who were looking forward in expectation to his coming, who were ready to hear his word and also the ones who were focused on God's priorities. So they weren't, they weren't swept up in the things of this 
world. They were looking forward to, to the spiritual things, the heavenly things, the things above. They were waiting for Jesus to come as their Messiah because they, rescued that they, they, because they knew that they need to be rescued. But you'll notice that it's still, it is this certain, you can't get away from it. It's a certain class of people, right? It's the poor, it's the outcasts. And that's actually, it's true. If you think about the ministry of the Lord Jesus, who was it that listened to him? By and large, there was the odd Pharisee. There was the odd rich person who who heard his message and put their trust in him. But mostly, who was it that when Jesus came and preached, they immediately responded? It was the poor and the crippled and the lame and the blind. They were the ones who were living in expectation. And, and through the course of history, it's often been like that, hasn't it? That it's the people who lack in this life, in this world. The people who, who haven't received all these good things like the Pharisees have received. Who are more receptive of the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's true globally. If I were to go out and and preach in the streets anywhere in Canada, I'm sure that most people would not want to hear what I have to say if I was preaching the gospel. Canada's a very wealthy place. Most people are going to say, we don't need that. We're fine. Leave us alone. But if I go to Papua New Guinea, a place that's materially poor, and I preach the gospel, people are receptive to it. They're open to it. And in a general way, that's true throughout the world. Those who have received much, it seems, readily reject the gospel. And those who lack, more readily receive the gospel. But we have to understand that it's not, you know, not having things doesn't save you. And that even these, these, these descriptions, the poor the crippled, the lame, and the blind, that they actually point us to deeper realities. It's it's those who recognize not just that they're poor materially, but that they're poor spiritually, who are ready to receive the gospel. It's those who who know that that they're they're crippled spiritually, that they, they can't do it on their own. They can't just sort of march into God's kingdom on their own strength. They need a helper It's those who recognize that they are blind that will have their eyes opened and and they'll be able to see who Jesus is. Those who are lame, who recognize that that they walk walk with with sin. Sin is is binding them, is holding them down, is breaking them down, and they need someone to rescue them from their sin. These are the people to whom the servant is sent. These are the people that Jesus went to in his ministry. When he preached, yes, he warned the Pharisees and he warned many people and they rejected him. But he also went and he sought out those who were open and receptive to the gospel. And there were people in his day. And they heard the gospel and they believed it. And so they were invited and welcomed into the Father's banquet. And so... You know, if the, if the story was to kind of stop there, we would think, oh, you know, it's, it's sort of complete. But the amazing thing is that this story doesn't stop there. The servant comes back and he says, well, I've done that, and there's still room. So then the master says, well, then go out beyond the city. And this is saying then, go out beyond Israel, beyond the borders of Israel. So it's not just the ministry of the Lord Jesus within the borders of Israel. Remember, he said, I came to seek the, the lost sheep of Israel. And so he's going back to the father, and the father's saying, well, then go beyond. Go, go out. Go out to the highways and the hedges. So that's the highways from city to city. So go outside the, the boundaries of the city. Go outside the boundaries of, of Israel, of the covenant people of God. Go out to the highways, and, and the highways are sort of where people would be. But don't just go to the highways only. Go to the remote places too. Follow the hedges. Go everywhere everywhere throughout this world, and, and invite people to come in, compel people to come even in even, that my house may be filled. And so the first part of that, the first sort of mission of the servant is to go and invite people within Israel. 
But the second mission of the servant is to go beyond Israel. The second mission is the great commission to go and make disciples of every tribe and nation and language and tongue, to share the gospel and to call people to come in to the Father's house. And this is the work of the Lord Jesus that was so great that he couldn't remain on earth to do. He had to ascend to heaven and pour out his spirit on the church so that the church could carry out this work. And this is the work that we have now as as church. I just want to make a few comments about this work. First of all, notice that there's two aspects of this work. The first aspect is to go The second aspect is to compel. So first, in the first, on the first hand, this mission is to go. And I want us to notice, because we have to get this, otherwise all of your 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 missional efforts will be lost. Who is it that's commissioned to go? In the parable. And the master said to his servant, go. Oftentimes when we hear great commission, we think, I've got this work. This is the work that we've got to do. It's the work that Jesus commissioned his disciples to do. It's true. But the, the first great commission was the commission that the father gave to his son. It's first of all the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot forget that as we carry the gospel out as a church, that we're doing the work that Jesus Christ was first commissioned to do, and that Jesus Christ is doing at the right hand of God the Father in heaven. He's sitting there on the throne. He's been lifted up by the Father, and he's been given that place in order to carry out this work. It's his work. It's the work of the Lord Jesus Christ to go. And so he's going. We we need to just keep that in mind, remember that. And and that's going to spur you to prayer as you carry out the work of mission and evangelism and sharing the gospel and meeting your neighbors. It's Jesus' work, first of all. That's the first aspect, go. Second aspect is compel. Now this compel is not sort of a compel of grab by the scruff of the neck, right? And and just sort of pull in, kicking and screaming. What this word means is, is persuade. Persuade the people to come in. And now we go to, okay, this work is the Lord Jesus. We need to get that in our hearts and minds. But it's the work that Jesus has given to the church in the Great Commission before he ascended into heaven. He's already received the Great Commission, and now he sends his disciples, and through his disciples, the church, and he says, go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and I'm with you always to the end of the age. And how is the church going to carry out this work? They're going to compel people to come in. That is, we need to know that as we carry this message, we carry a message that is powerful, that is persuasive. And we need to bring this message with that power, understanding that the Father's house is not full. And so we go, and, and, and as Paul, the Apostle Paul said, that the, the, the love of Christ compels us to go. And we go and we share about this Father. And we share about this Savior. And we tell people that, that they're living in darkness. And they're living in sin, and they might not know what sin is, but we can explain that to them. It's a rejection of your creator. But but by in his love and, and grace, God doesn't want you to stay in your sin. He doesn't want you to stay in your rejection. If you stay there, you will be punished. There is judgment. But you also need to know that there is room. There's open chairs in the house of the Father, just like there's open chairs here. And then there's a place, there's an invitation for you to come in. To, to know that, that there's a, a place of warmth and love and acceptance. And eternal life where you can be received and you can have life with the Father forever. That's, that's the message. That's, that's how we persuade. That's how we compel. It's the message that we carry out as the church. 
We need to know then that that's the purpose. What's Christ's ultimate purpose in this great commission? Sometimes in the work of evangelism as Christians, we can feel like we've got so much to do. We've got so much to do. I can remember being in university at McMaster, and, and I'm not sure exactly at what time, but at a certain point, the Lord was working in my heart, and it dawned on me that there was all these people here who needed to hear the gospel. All these people who were rejecting God. And, and I would go to school every day, and I'd feel this incredible burden like, I need to share the gospel with all these people. But of course, if you feel like you need to share the gospel to everyone, how many people do you end up sharing the gospel with? No one. You know, the odd person may be here or there. But, but I, I just felt like I was carrying around this incredible burden. But, but this work, it ought not to feel like a burden. Because what's the purpose of the Lord Jesus? He's not focused on himself. We shouldn't be focused on ourselves. What should we be focused on? We should be focused on the Father's house. That place of of communion and and love and acceptance through the blood of Christ. And we should know that that there's, there's places that are open in that house. The love of God the Father should compel us. The plan of God the Father should compel us. The priorities of God the Father Because Christ will not come until the plan of God is complete. And so, knowing of God's love to us, that love compels us. That should be in our mind. God's house is in full. His grace is in full yet. His love isn't isn't fulfilled. It's not complete yet. There's more to give. And so we go. And so we persuade and we compel and we share this wonderful news of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Now finally, then, we come to our third point. In light of this, then, how, how, how should we live? How do you live focused on, on the priorities of God? How do you live focused on the resurrection? We need to realize that as Jesus is telling this parable, he's not happy because the people around him aren't focused on that day, right? The, the, the person who he's having a banquet with, he's not focused on that day because he's, he's not inviting the poor and the lame and the crippled and the blind. He, he's, not, he's not sharing the bounty that he has with those kinds of people. He's also disturbed because of what this one man says. So the, the, the one man, he's a hypocrite by what he's doing. Right? He's, saying, he's saying he believes in the resurrection, but, but he has no time for for, you know, that class of people. But then the second man, he seems to disturb the Lord Jesus even more. He says, and what he says is true in verse 15. When one of those who reclined at table with him heard these things, he said to him, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. That's a true statement. Everyone who eats bread in the kingdom of God is blessed. But Jesus responds to this man by this parable saying, yeah, there's a bunch of people who are not going to be at that feast. And it's you. So what is it about this man that sort of sets the Lord Jesus off? It's the hypocrisy. It's that this man is saying true things, but he doesn't believe it in his heart. And he's not living it out in his life. He's saying, blessed is everyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God, but he doesn't have the grace and the love to share the bread at his own table with people who aren't like him people who are different than him or people who lack what he has. What Jesus is saying is we need to stop living according to the priorities of of today. If you live according to the priorities of today, then, then you'll do what these men are doing in this parable. You'll say true things, but you won't believe them. You won't share what you have with others. But he's saying, we need to, in light of the future, in light of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ and what's going to happen on that day, we need to change how we live today. You've heard the expression, think globally, act locally. Well, this is think eternally, but act temporally. 
focus your sight on the grace that's going to be revealed when Christ returns and then reflect that grace in your life today by who you invite to dinner, by who you spend your time with, by who you pray for, by what sort of fills up your agenda, what's your to-do list filled up with, by what fills up your time, by what fills up your heart. Our lives need to change. Our lives need to change. Our priorities, if you see yourself in those Pharisees who who set earthly things as their priorities, like I do, then you recognize that you need to repent. And you need to set the priorities of God the Father and the return of Jesus Christ as, as your priority in your life. And we need to reflect that. We need to reflect that. And the thing is, we can. We can. It's hard. It's hard. It's sacrifice. It's called sacrifice for a reason. Why? Because it hurts. Right? It hurts. It's going to cost you something. And if you're living for the here and now, you're not going to be able to do it. In order to do the things that Jesus is talking about here, it's going to feel like someone's, you've got to rip out your kidney. Or you've got to cut off your leg in order to, to, to do those things because you're focused on, on, on what I have and, and my time and, and my, my material things and, and my pleasure and, and I need a break and me, me, me. But if you have your sight set on, on the return of the Lord Jesus Christ, if that's your priority, then, then those things aren't so important to you anymore. And then you can sacrifice and it's going to hurt, but you can do it. Because you're not looking for your reward today. But you know there's a reward coming. That's what Jesus promises in this parable, in this text. There's a reward coming. So look forward to that day. Look forward to that reward. Look forward to that feast. Look forward to the time when Jesus Christ is going to return. And all this work, which is sacrificial and is difficult, it's going to be over. And we're going to sit at the most amazing wedding banquet ever. And we're going to be in the presence of our Savior. And we're going to be there forever. Focus on that day. The Lord Jesus is inviting you to feast at his Father's banquet. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, We thank you for the invitation that you give to us. What an incredible act of grace, of condescension, that you would invite us to feast with you. We thank you for the blood of Jesus Christ through whom we can be received at your table, through whom we become your children as we're united to him, the groom. Help us to look forward to that day. Father, so easily the things of this world just crowd out the spiritual things, the heavenly things, the things that that you would have us focus on. And so we confess our sin as well. And we ask that you would teach us to make your priorities our priority and to live in light in the light of the great day of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.